is an American actor known for his breakout role as Fez in the Emmy-nominated sitcom That 70s Show. His current role as Special Agent Nick Torres in NVIS, and Ostigan Madrigal, the Academy Award-winning Disney animated film in Conzo. Behind the camera, Wilmer established his production company, WV Entertainment, where he continues to develop projects in the alternative and scripted spaces. Today he joins us as an author, celebrating the release of An American Story, the remarkable true story of a young immigrant from Venezuela who had a dream to change the world, a talent for entertaining, and a determined spirit to build new life. Woo! Also in conversation with Wilmer today is Eva Longoria, a Golden Globe nominated actress, producer, and director best known for her work on The Desperate Housewives. Please welcome Wilmer and Eva. Wilmer's many things, an author, tech guy. Yes, yes, <laughs> Thank you everyone for being here, how beautiful, what a beautiful turnout. I really appreciate you guys making the time to, uh, to be here this Saturday morning. Uh, you know, it's a very vulnerable thing to do, to, uh, you know, to kind of do deep dives on, on your life and the trajectory and the, the road of your life. So the fact that you would make a little time to <clears throat> help me celebrate uh, my family story and and uh, you know what got me to here uh, means so much. Um, I know you guys have, some of you have followed the stuff I've done in my, my career, and uh, to see you here, it means it means so much. Uh, I've been on the road, you know, from New York to yeah. Miami to San Antonio, Texas, Chula Vista last night, and um, and just the stories, you know, and your reflections, I just it really really touched me. So just thank you for showing up today. Thank you. No, I'm so happy you guys are here to to witness this. Has anybody? Have y'all already read the book yet? Anybody read it already? other than your family. <laughs> you guys don't count, okay? <laughs> you, you lived it. Um, but I'm so excited to uh, have this conversation with, with you. I am, Wilmer knows, uh, first of all, I already knew 90% of what happened in this book, and when I read it, I was crying, I was laughing. Your voice is clearly in every sentence and every word, and that's what you hope for in a memoir. Um, I will tell you the scariest thing for me in the world is probably writing a memoir. Like I was like, I don't want to tell people where the bodies are buried. Um, and so anytime a good friend of mine writes one, I want to know what possessed you to embark on a memoir. Uh, I haven't answered that question myself. Um, but I, I will tell you, uh, the book didn't start out as a, as a memoir. You know, my, uh, at first when there was an idea of, of getting into the book, you know, world. I was fascinated about, you know, what drove people to, you know, to read a story, you know, and um, and then I started really reflecting on mostly the service, you know, and, and what we've kind of strayed away from the community conversation. I started realizing so much that uh, we have been amplifying so much of what uh, separates us. And I started, you know, I, I've been traveling with the USO for about 20 years now. I've been to almost every military base around the world from Iraq to Afghanistan to South Korea to Germany, Bahrain, Greenland, Lithuania, no, no and I saw so many of our faces wearing these uniforms, so many of our brothers and sisters. I realized very quickly that for the military, you know, this colorless institution, you know, <clears throat> when, they, when they stood by one another, when they stood together and defending the virtues of the American flag, um, they really afforded us so much, you know? And I, and I started very understanding, like, okay, maybe this is a book of service. Maybe I can do a tribute to my travel with the military, <clears throat> my thank you to the troops. Um, and then as I started reflecting on how grateful I was to them and what they had afforded me um, uh, and my family here in this country, uh, I started reflecting on my mother's sacrifice, on my father's sacrifice, and everything that they had to do um, to come here. <clears throat> and then immediately I started telling these stories and to live to to live your parents sacrifice as an adult hey, let, me, let me say let me deep, dig a little deeper I know, that but it, we're gonna dig into the yeah. your your journey but but tell me like well you me know uh, when you're a kid yeah. you know you 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 are you understanding right you know that there is something happening at home but your parents do a really good job of just keeping your focus on the things you got to do 
Um, then you grow up, and maybe at some point in your life, you decide to ask some questions. You start deciding to ask him, Mommy, how did you do that? Or like, how, what, what were you thinking when this happened? Or like, where, where were you at? And, and they look at you now as an adult and as a friend, and they op open up. And so in this, um, it was incredibly difficult to relive your parents' sacrifice as an adult because I had no idea. Um, and it made me even more grateful of that. So I had to tell their story too. Yeah, I mean, for, well, I wanna say I'm in love with your dad. Um, what, I mean, your family in general, but like even your prologue, I was already in tears with your prologue and like how you start the book, because you immediately hook people in of how important this man is in your life was in your life and talking about that journey i i mean i knew you were i knew you everybody knows you're venezuelan um <laughs> everybody knows that but i did i forgot you were you were born in miami you went back you came back and especially our relevant uh everything that's happening in venezuela ahora like tell us about this um straddling the hyphen of being venezuelan american because you are like one of the most American people I know, what you represent, what you do, your activism, your USO work, all of that is so patriotic, and yet you are so Venezuelan and so proud of that beautiful country and, and heritage. And so you talk a lot about the immigrant experience, but like, what was that in the book? Um, you know, going back, coming back as a kid, because also you seem like a really smart six-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> you were emotionally like I was very curious, happening. man. I was very curious. Yes, yes. but you were high, curious, and you were very caring about your parents' situation. So I can only imagine you now as an adult. But like, talk to me about that immigrant experience and how you talk about it in the book. Yeah, no, thank you for that. It, it's it's so funny. I think <clears throat> when you live in America, you know, you tend to feel like you're living in Disneyland, right? You think that like the violence and the things that we experience in America is is really bad. Um, I grew up in a world where the six o'clock news were, you know, were movies. They were like actual thrillers, you know what I mean? You're talking about, you know, I don't even want to describe it, but my, my point is, <clears throat> at a very younger age, I was, I was kind of welcomed to a, 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 a different reality. Um, you know, my parents, back in the early 80s, uh, the Bolivar and the dollar went, <clears throat> were one in one, right? So. So you never left Venezuela. You actually came, you went to Miami for vacation, you know, in the early 80s. And at three years old, my parents decided to move back to Venezuela because that's where the work was. They wanted to go and start the agriculture industry. So we went back to Venezuela and started the agriculture industry. And we, he had a, a finca, he had a farm. And, you know, it was one of those hustlers um, farms. You had rice, you had corn, you have pigs, you had ch chickens, you have cows. You, I mean, you literally, he tried to do, sell anything he could from this farm. Um, and we, so we grew up that way. But, you know, the, the reality was that uh, in the early 90s, there was a, you know, there was a, a young general by the name of Hugo Chavez. And Hugo Chavez, uh, you know, performed a coup on the government and, and failed. You know, that coup did, didn't succeed. Um, my dad, I don't know how he had the foresight uh, for this, but immediately he knew that there was a destabilization happening. There was a fracturing of the country and that something was not going to be right. And he said, it's time for us to go back. And, and you know, economically and corruption and, you know, um, politically, the country was just uh, in a spiral. Um, and, uh, you know, the industry, the agriculture industry was getting very, very difficult. So my dad felt like it was time for us to, but to go back. But I also appreciate your journey of like, like you said, you, you, you talk about, you're like, I, I think my family was poor, but I never, we never felt poor. Cause I felt the same way in Texas. Yeah. I was like, I'm, I'm swimming in, in dough. And I was yeah. like, and then I looked at other kids. I'm like, oh, okay, no, we're poor. No, no, they're swimming. <laughs> they're swimming in dough. <laughs> yes, yes. I thought I had Nikes, but yes. they were like fake yeah. Nikes from the flea market. Yeah. Um, so like, whenever you say that about, about your dad, but I love that you wrote too. It's like, thanks to the grace of God, dad had possessed this foresight to get us out of Venezuela early when when it was still, you know, not difficult, but your aunts and yeah. uncles and cousins weren't so lucky. Yeah, no, they, they're still there. I mean, I in this last election, we were communicating with my with my tias and my cousins in Caracas. And, um, you know, here's the reality. I, I'll say a couple of things here that might actually make you feel happy that you're at Barson Noble in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, people, uh, people work very hard to try to make $3 a month. 
in Venezuela. The government gives them bags of food. Oftentimes they're expired, you know. Um, there's a level of desperation from the people out there that it just doesn't even make it out, right? There's, it's such a close neighbor of ours, right? And then the tragedy is to know that they're the third largest producer of oil in the world and the number one reserve of oil on the planet. So the fact that like we don't have a South American Dubai is insane to me, right? The fact that we don't have, you know, a country that's so close to all the American countries, from North to Central to South America, and that our gas prices are so high, considering how how close the proximity of of this oil could be to to just bringing prices down and 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 helping export and import be a lot more it's, it's, it's just beyond me that Venezuela can get it together and actually really figure that one out um, but yeah to your point it's my, my dad you know I had a funny way to, to look at life and, and you know like you said you know we never knew we were poor because we will, we'll, we will have a birthday party no matter what was happening you know? <laughs> right, yeah yeah there was always a celebration um, and so how did your immigrant experience inform your activism with immigrant rights because you talk about it in the book, but like... Yeah, no, so, I, I, you know, many, 20 plus years ago, and, uh, you know, I, I, I want to also reflect a little bit on our friendship on this one. Um, Eva, you have been also on this same, um, the same fight for common sense for, for decades. I mean... Yeah. Common sense. Common sense rights. <laughs> common sense rights, just like the thing that makes sense. I need you to just think of that. Um, and, you know, about 20 plus years ago, maybe it was 25 years ago, um, you know, we started Little Ripples with, you know, with um, the census campaign, like represent, right? Like Voto Latino came out and was like, let's, 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 let's get everybody to be counted in the census. And all of a sudden that number came in and people were like, oh, oh, wait a minute, hold on one second. Like Latinos are not just a neighbor in one neighborhood, there's like, more of us in the neighborhood and we never were counted we realized oh well, imagine if they get registered to vote and then the idea was to kind of rise up and, and 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 have this community join the other communities that also share the common sense you know and um but it was the stories that i was encountering that i realized they're my mom they're my dad they're my sisters um they're you they're me you had an accent yeah. you yeah. didn't speak english yeah yeah, you know? and and so I I felt so privileged to be at a position where I could just say something that made sense. Yeah. Going back to that, mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't doing it alone in so many places, right? I had you, yeah. you know, um, I had Rosario Dawson, uh, you know, uh, America Ferrera. You know, we we were out there making a little noise when it wasn't cool to make that noise, yeah. you know, when we were. But um, but the more that our community woke up, the more I felt. Um, this was more of a purpose than than mm -hmm. than most of my career. Yeah. Well, speaking of of an immigrant with an accent, let's talk about Fez. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we don't even know where he came from. Where did he come from? Yeah. People always ask you about the accent, but my favorite story in the book is um, when you got the job. Like, were you, were you sixteen or seventeen when you uh, auditioned? I was I was seventeen, and then I turned eighteen. Yeah. Um, on the show. Uh, yeah. On the show. Um, and I and I want to talk about your dad too, but like, you guys, your dad has no work at the time. Yeah. You guys can't buy groceries. Mm -hmm. You don't have gas money to go to auditions. Yeah. You have to ask a neighbor for gas money. Yeah. To go to that final callback. Yeah. And um, that, because I I remember that journey. Except it was it was just for me. Like I was like I can't believe I got desperate housewives and and struggling like that. You were feeling that because of your family. Yeah. That's, that, I didn't have that pressure. Mm -hmm. And and you're driving to the audition and you're looking at your dad and you go, dad, I'm gonna get this for us. I'm gonna get this for us. And your dad looks at you and says, if you get it, very good. If you don't, very good. Mm -hmm. There was no, you didn't put pressure on you yeah. to go like, you must get this so we can eat. Yeah. But you felt that pressure. I did, you know, I, I, I did feel that pressure. And I think, you know, any, any son or daughter um, who comes to, you know, I mean, who just is aware of what their parents is, you know, about their parents, you know, journey is, um, feels a little helpless. Like, what can I do? You know, how do I help with rent? That looks expensive, you know? And, 
you know, but at that time, <clears throat> I remember there's a story in the book about when my dad's car gets stolen. Yeah. And my dad used to drive a car <clears throat> and would put a for sale sign all year round on it. He would sell it for a little profit, buy a new one, put another for sale sign. And during the time, he was bringing mechanics, uh, you know, parts and things like that from shop to shop all day long while, <clears throat> while he was trying to sell that car and then flip the car for another one. And that was like the hustle. Um, and you know, the gas money was the problem, right? Like you had to <laughs> pump gas in these cars. And I remember <clears throat> my dad allowed me to start auditioning because I had a pretty good report card, you know? And I, by the way, I had a pretty good report card thanks to my sisters. Big shout out to my <laughs> sisters. Um, I was the artist. <laughs> I was the artist on the show, yeah. But, but, uh, but I would say, um, you know, to your point, my, my, my dad would, you know, there, there's this crazy audition, you know, we were rent, we were late and rent like three months, and then we were, you know, we were going to the 99 cent stores for, for groceries, you know. And I go and audition for this thing, and it was this pilot, you know, and it was called Teenage Wasteland, and we didn't know what it was gonna be. And went in audition, my dad had to ask for money at the, you know, to the, to the neighbor. He took me to audition, and then I got a call back, and he's like, oh, I have to ask the neighbor for more money. Um, and then he took me to that audition. I remember auditioning my ass off, and then I came home. It's a really funny audition scene in here. It's so crazy. It's so funny. <laughs> it's really you gotta see how we got the part. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then but you, you get home. Yeah. I get home, and I, and you know, the, the phone rings, and I pick up the call, and, and uh, it's my agent at the time, and my agent says, hey, they want you to come back tomorrow. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, we have a call back. Like, we're really close. And then he says, we want you to come back tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that and the day after that and i was making fifteen thousand dollars for that first episode which is more than my dad made in like two years you know so um yeah it was it was definitely a, a, a not just an eye-opening experience but it was a, a great confirmation that you know here in america you know anything can really happen you know and, and i was relentless for four years and saying like this is what i'm gonna do yeah but it's funny that i feel when you talked about um you moved back to the United States from Venezuela, and you didn't go to Miami, which probably would have been easier. You came to Los Angeles, and it was a little harder. You thought you would never learn the idi idioms. Yeah. And I don't think you still know them, but uh, <laughs> if we're being fair. Absolutely. <laughs> she would know. She would absolutely know me. I still don't get it. About the same way. He's like, don't, don't rain on my car. <laughs> parade. Don't rain on my parade. Yeah. Um, yes, yes. No, we, I used to make up so much shit because I just didn't know meta metaphors. Metaphors is how I learned how to speak English, and I would come up with the weirdest metaphor. Like, if you don't get in the car, you'll never get there. Wait, what's the car? That's the car part. Is the what's, car is like the car? you? It's like, is that the vessel of faith? Like, is, the call, is the car my agent? My agent? Or, or like, and what's there? When you get there, like, what's over there? Like, what are we talking about? You're like... Exactly. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but okay. Um, sorry, I've di I've digressed because I.